I'm a faculty member at Michigan State University in the Department of Agriculture, Food and Resource Economics. I'm also the Deputy Director of a Feed the Future funded uh, project called MIAS, and Modernizing Extension and Advisory Services. We provide global backstopping support to uh, USAID missions. And I'm also leading a climate change adaptation assessment for another USAID project uh, across the Sahel called ARC. So I'm rather busy these days. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I will try to communicate as clearly as I can a lot of complex and um, um, very broad issues. Um, my acuity is somewhere stretched between the jet lag and the great Ethiopian coffee of this morning, so I'll, I'll try to find my way. Um, I'm going to quickly go through, but, but one of my objectives here is really to get you, all of you, to begin to think about your own perceptions and understanding and thoughts towards scaling. Really, how do you define uh, or, or think about scaling in terms of the adaptation of agricultural technologies and practices? What are your own uh, perceptions and conceptualizations? Um, how do we design or how do you think about designing the potential for scaling up uh, the uptake of agricultural innovation? What, what sort of mental models do you have based on experiences and perhaps things you've learned here? And also something we haven't talked much about, but how do we be continue to sustain the momentum of scaling behavior change once it's been initiated? The issue of time is very important and it comes up again and again and often does not fit well with our project cycles, but we don't want things to stop at the last day of our three or five year funded effort. So just to remind people, you know, agriculture is a very place-based initiative. It depends where you are on the planet. And there's a couple, you know, big, principles to think about. One is sort of the natural site, and if we look at crop-based agriculture, it's where crops are able to grow based on the biophysical condition. Soils, rainfall, temperature, et cetera, et cetera. That's really the uh, comparative advantage of different regions, different uh, countries uh, for the production of different commodity crops. But over that, uh, human influence overlays a social e economic influence, we'll call the social economic uh, uh, site. And really where we allow crops to grow. We eliminate crops that we don't want, those species we don't want. We introduce species that weren't there previously in the hopes that they will flourish. And we spend increasing amounts of time uh, on the manipulation of that production environment to meet our objectives. So it's the balancing of what's possible and what we uh, put our energies behind. It's a good to keep in mind when we think about agriculture because every agriculture activity is not, uh, does not have endless potential in all environments. So, you know, 30 years ago, uh, USAID uh, spent a great deal of time and effort and money uh, uh, behind the farming systems and the approach. Talked a lot about yes, systems yesterday and system thinking, and it's really uh, fallen off, I, I think, out of the agendas and off the table in a lot of our discussions. And I think particularly when we talk about scaling uh, and getting the right fit for technologies and practices, it's good to come back to some of these uh, uh, systemic principles. Uh, just to do a quick summary from the good old uh, Shainer et al. publication, uh, you know, we, we spent a lot of time looking at the physical environment, uh, soils, uh, et cetera, the biological environment, uh, uh, crop and animal species, the economic environment, the social environment, uh, the institutional environment in which we are attempting to engage in agriculture change, behavior change, agriculture system change. We also spent a lot of time focusing on understanding better household characteristics, preferences, um, land uh, access different households have, household members, the labor households could command, and the differences between uh, people's labors and their bit, uh, ability to use it for their own, for their own interests, uh, capital, uh, and the different enterprises, that portfolio of activities that farm households engaged in. A lot of this, you can see the kind of the, the precursors of the livelihood framework assessment. Uh, you know, and, and between these things, we began to kind of combine them, put them together, and looked at what we would call the recommendation domain, right? This is where we framed our research questions. And if we were really good in our research enterprise, we maybe had some suggestions or um, uh, opportunities to, to offer the farmer in within that recommendation domain. But when we talk about scale, for any technology, any practice, this is your environment. This is what you're trying to scale to. This is where that activity, that variety, that management practice, that market is relevant. This is your, if, if, if you reached everyone within this domain, you would have 100% uptake, okay? So this is your scale. 
how we look at that across the, the landscape, you can begin to map this out geographically. This is sort of a stylized little image here. Circles could be, you know, households or fields or farms or community, but you have in a sense that there are uh, boundaries that can be drawn based on the relative importance of different influences or factors delimiting where certain activities are appropriate and where they're not as appropriate. Um, every innovation has this natural scale of utility or potential uptake. Now, another question that we haven't asked, but there's been some examples thrown out, is whether we should exercise or exploit that fully. You know, we, we can overproduce commodities. We get every person who can produce bananas producing bananas, there's not going to be enough uptake of those bananas, and we're going to have price collapse and, and nobody benefits. So there has to be a bit of prudence and good judgment used when we begin to look at the exploitation of scale potential. Um, no innovation is permanent. Right? Agriculture change is a process, never ending. It's evolution in, 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 in real time. And we need to begin to think about this a lot more in our discussions. Uh, in, in particular, I, I did a sense a lot of the discussions are sort of about technology promotion campaigns. It's a one-off variety promotion campaign or one-off practice campaign. Very good. But does that answer the question of development? I mean, we need to begin to think at this in a systemic uh, process. Uh, with the four scenes of climate change, uh, energy price change, population growth, et cetera, we're going to be in, uh, put in the position of needing to continue to change ever more rapidly going forward. So mounting in individual campaigns to promote individual technologies may not be able to answer all the challenges that are in their future. We may need to look at some of those systems able to deliver one variety after another, one practice one after another, and not just promoting the individual uh, incidents in isolation. I'm going on a bit long about this, but it's important. Um, okay, so how do innovations get out into the landscape? This is our good old friend Ev Rogers. Some of you might have become familiar with. He started his work in the early 60s. He looked at how innovation, how diffuse within populations. Then he looked at uh, following the, the blue uh, uh, normal distribution curve, uh, going from your left to right. Uh, he divided up uh, potential adopters into five categories. And the first two are most important for you because they're the ones that you have most experience with. It, they're the innovators and the, and the early adopters. Those people who are very inquisitive about uh, the potentials or the opportunities that new technologies offer. The people who join in those, those uh, uh, pilot projects. They're not the ones where you get your numbers. You're 200,000, you're 400,000, you're 2 million. Those are coming in the, the early and late majority adopters, and at the very tail end, the laggards are brought in. Okay, so this this happens over a, a, a time scale, and it's a very important um, kind of transition point between those early adopters and innovators and and the rest. Um, innovators and early adopters are experimenting with things all the time, and they abandon things all the time also when they don't pay off. Those things that really go to scale are those things that are made, that are able to jump the gap into the majority of, of, of the adopters, the people who are looking over the fences and watching and observing and waiting. Okay, this is where we had to pay a lot of attention in our planning and our design. Um, and again, just to note that 100% of adoption is not 100% of the farmers, it's 100% of your scale domain, however that is defined. Um, Looking at, again, another view on the adoption process, how do individuals go about the adoption? Well, number one, they need to become aware of, of, of the innovation. Okay, awareness comes first. Interest, they need to be interested in what the uh, innovation offers. They need, at that point, begin to evaluate their ability to use that innovation and how it might be fit in, fitted into their farming systems, how they might actually begin to use it. And if that kind of, if they can begin to see a pathway there on their own farms, they begin to look at the trialing it. It's a variety, you try it on a small patch in a corner of a field. If it's a practice, you try it a little bit here, a little bit there, and see how it works out, okay? Uh, oftentimes, particularly with management practices, there's some adaptation that goes along with this. It's not just adopting the recommendations as it's presented to you or that you saw the dem uh, at the demonstration plot, but you need to adjust it to fit your own farming systems, your own resources, your own skills and interests. And lastly, 
once it's sort of gone through a trial period and really has proven itself, perhaps over a couple of years, you begin to employ it or truly adopt it at the farm scale. Okay? So this is how it happens with, with individuals. The innovators do this, the early adopters do this, the majority, the laggards, they all do this. This is just the human behavior of agriculture uh, uh, adoption or change. So, you know, we, we can begin to ask ourselves how many, dis how many dissemination efforts explicitly are designed to accommodate or facilitate this whole step of processes. Not many. So I guess your charge then might be to look at how you can begin to build in these elements of human behavior in the, the, the products that are funded or the efforts that you're putting resources behind to make sure you are enabling people to adopt and uptake practices more easily. And this is the graph here of Iowa farmers and their adoption of pesticide uses in the 40s and the 50s. Um, and the front edge, the, the red, starting at the lower left are the innovators and on the upper right are the laggards. And this shows when these different uh, kind of uh, groups of the population became aware of the new technology. People don't become aware of, of new opportunities all at the same time. They have their own communication channels. They're looking with degrees of, of, of different degrees of interest for new innovations. So not everyone becomes aware at the same time. The back edge is when people actually finally had gone through that five-step process and actually adopted the practice at field level. And what we find is that the innovators actually make those decisions much more quickly than the laggards. Laggards take almost twice as much time to come to the decision of whether to adopt or not. And the, and the different segments are in the middle are at, are at different uh, time lengths. So not only did they learn about innovations at different time periods, it takes them longer to come to, to decisions. And we need to be cognizant of this, particularly when we're trying to reach particular numbers and targets. Um, so the question is, how many of our interventions are really designed to allow uh, uh, scaling to happen, okay, to really let, let it take off. And the answer probably is not very many. The little red bars there are about, is, is about a 10-year period, and you've reached 50% of the farmers uh, of who could potentially adopt that technology. Every technology has its own kind of adoption uptake curve, right? They're, they're not all the same in terms of their rapidity, and that depends a lot on the characteristics of the technology itself. Uh, the relative uh, perception of advantages that farmers have for that technology, the complexity of the technology, the riskiness of adopting that technology, the trialability, you know, how, how lumpy is the technology? A tractor is a tractor. You can't try half a tractor. you got to buy the tractor or not buy the tractor, whereas seeds, you can try seeds out in, at, at almost any scale you want. And the observability of the advent advantage that's offered by the technology. Building up soil organic matter takes a decade, right? And it, we know this, and it's very hard to see and to observe the benefits over short periods of time. Other, other chemical uh, mineral fertilizers you can put on the soil and see an immediate response that year. Uh, each technology you know, has its own characteristics, and with agriculture, you often get only one chance of making an observation per year. So it's really critical that we design our, our interventions, our extension activities to maximize that. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to kind of zoom along here a little bit. But one of the things I want you to keep in mind is that, you know, at its core, at least within our uh, North American perspective, and a lot of the countries that we've helped to assist in, in designing and developing and strengthening extension systems, extension really is about human capital enhancing education and training. It's strengthening people's uh, capabilities for self-determination. Um, we do a lot of different things in terms of activities. We extend technologies and methods. Uh, T&V is probably the poster child for that. We're going to hear from Digital Green shortly about another using new, new medium, new technologies, uh, allowing farmers to be in much more control of what the agenda is for uh, the technology choice, using uh, the, 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 the trust validity of local, of local people to enhance the communication of new technology. Um, Advisory services, we often are answering uh, farmers' questions. Advisory services are, are often key in doing that. This is particularly important to domain for the private sector, and we're going to hear from the FIP program about how they begin to build into uh, uh, this kind of uh, question-answer uh, and private uh, enterprise dimension into extension. 
non-formal education and learning, farmer field school is probably the most uh, recent sort of iteration of that. Uh, and we also are involved a lot in facilitation, you know, organ helping groups to organize, helping them to form into associations and involve into businesses. And we're going to hear uh, from uh, Catholic Relief Services on the development of their five skill set modules, which really is those common elements that all successful groups share, irrespective of where they are in the world. There's some basic things that we found that all groups have, have done to become successful, and it's been built into now a training module uh, to, to help uh, uh, accelerate the uh, technology diffusion. Okay. Um, there's lots of ways of getting here. This graph way complex, but you can look at this later. It's just to let you know that there's different sources of funding. Those are the, the horizontal uh, columns across the top. Down the, the, the vertical axis are actually the implementers or, or, or the providers. So you can have public sources of funding, private sources of funding, farmer organizations, and you can have all sorts of different providers of those services. And it depends on the kind of services that are being provided and also the context within which you're working. What is the best mix? The reality is we work in a pluralistic environment. I don't call it a pluralistic system because the individual actor groups do not interrelate positively uh, with each other often. Um, but anyways, I just wanted to let you know it, it's, not, it's not a blueprint out there. It's really going to require you to do some reflection and some analysis of what fits best in your context given what your objectives are. The value of extension, I should have probably put this slide up first. Uh, you know, a number of studies have kind of looked at rates of return, going back to the cost-benefit analysis, appraisals, 13 to 80 percent. Another set of studies came up with a medium return on investment of 60 plus percent. Um, when you see really high rates of return, you say, Yahoo, this is a great investment, but it's an indication of historical underinvestment in, in the activity. And the reason we see such high rates of return to extension is because there's been decades long neglect of this sector. And so any money we, we, we put into it, we're getting great returns back. And as you begin to saturate and build up capacities and, and harvest a lot of that low hanging fruit, those rates of returns are going to drop down to more normal levels in the high teens and low 20s. Um, OK. Just real quickly, because I'm almost out of time, right? Two minutes, great. Um, you know. I, I think it was Lynn yesterday was kind of going back to some of the history of, of scaling. It, it's so much deeper than that. Uh, you know, our, our good friend David Corton back in 1980 was talking about scaling up then and the learning process that we all go through in trying to have impact of scale. And he had kind of pulled out three essential elements that I think are very germane to our uh, consideration of the same objective now. One is, is, is learning how to be um, efficient, uh, excuse me, effective. Learning how to do the thing. Whatever it is, multiply and disseminate seeds, enable groups to form and get engaged in value change, whatever the, it is, but learning how to do it and do it well, okay? The, 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 the second phase is learning how to do this more efficiently, using fewer resources, doing it more quickly, uh, with stronger partnerships, okay? So it's getting efficient at whatever it is you've learned how to do, and finally trying to reach that natural scale of whatever the intervention is, is, is hoping to get to. But I think the, these principles are still, really are very germane to us now, and we can begin to think about our funding and the sequencing of these kind of objectives. We're not trying to hit scale at the starting point. You've got to learn how to do the thing first. Then you've got to you know, be quicker about it and more efficient and so on. So just some last bullet points here, if you allow me. Um, one is, you know, in terms of scaling up, using what we know about human behavior to support behavior change. We do know a lot about human behavior, how people communicate, how they adopt uh, innovations, how they exchange innovations amongst themselves. We need to begin building this behavioral knowledge into our programs to affect behavior change. Point. Uh, we need to start using what we know about the diffusion of innovation and design our interventions to reach those appropriate scales. We're not overproducing. We're not. We're not putting out fictitious or, or, or non-justified numbers, but we're, we're really trying to find out what the appropriate scale is and looking at the technology of the process and using those characteristics to help design or inform the design of our intervention. We need to sustain efforts long enough to allow scaling to happen. We're talking decades. We're talking decades. Okay, we need to get this into our heads. There are certain uh, innovations, certain practices that can occur quicker 
but by and large, we're talking about processes that occur much more, much longer than our current project cycles. And so we're, we're, we're continually being frustrated not having the impact. We were never going to have the impact. It wasn't possible. We just had the wrong idea going into it. So we kind of set ourselves up for, for the frustration. I think we need to change there. Oftentimes, we need to work at scale to have scale to achieve scaled impacts. You can't always start with a little pilot and grow to national coverage. You often have to work at national coverage level to have national impacts. And it's going to be different for different kinds of practices, processes, or technologies. And we need to sort that out so that it becomes built into our programming. Last point, um, engaging in process and relationships with the potential to continually deliver new information, new options, new poss uh, possibilities. Not doing one-off promotion campaigns unless you have an extraordinary opportunity. They come up, but there's not, it's not bread and butter. We need to build institutions. We need to work on uh, policy reform. We need to work on a lot of things. And it's not just promoting uh, the new technology. So it's not one or the other. It's all in. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. And thanks, Amy, for the timekeeping. That was